Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and we are here for my NACL Week 3 overview analysis. And of course, at the end, my updated power rankings. One of the most fun weeks of NACL action that we have had in a very long time, both in terms of games that we expected to be great and some major upsets, teams that are really proving to be top of the line when it comes to their performance so far this year that maybe a lot of people were not expecting. A lot of these provisional teams really stepping up. We're going to be keeping the format from last week. If you haven't checked out that video, obviously you'll pick up the format relatively quickly, I would say, here as we go through it. But if you're familiar with my other content, instead of going game by game, talking about every single best of two, every single series, because there are so many series here in the NACL and there are just so many things to go through and talk about. Uh, instead, we're going to be going for a more scoreboard style approach. Uh, last week, I tried it out, but my audio did not match. I still spent like five to six minutes on every single game, which is not the intention here. That will still be an hour and a half, hour, 40 minute long video. And that's just not my intention with a lot of these NACL recaps. I'm going to try to keep this closer to under an hour, if at all possible. If I can do that, that would be great. Ideally, I would want these to be a little bit more bite-sized than some of my other pieces of content. So if you guys are excited for that, I don't, I really don't want to waste too much time on these intros. I'm going to be trying to hold myself to, uh, you know, three, four minutes per, <laughs> per recap here. So if you guys are excited, let me know down in the comment section below. What did you guys think of the NACL here in week three? Of course, if you're new, we're going to be going over all three days of NACL games, all six series in each of those days. And I am excited to do so. So without further ado, let's go ahead and kick off day number one. And Day number one was a really, really interesting day. We saw a lot of, you know, upsets, I would say, but a lot of teams that are really stepping up to the plate here already in day number one. Starting off with our first series, FlyQuest Challengers taking on CLG Challengers, and they split one-to-one. -one. Pretty decent series, I would say. CLG definitely looked much better in game number one. They were really just on top of the ball, Meech in particular. Meech and Breezy, uh, I've kind of talked about them on the series already, have really started to improve as a bot lane. Meech is going to get my player of the series, as you can see here, but he's certainly not the only one on the team to play well here. I thought Kevy also had a really, really good game in game number one. Copy continues to be this team's probably most consistent and best player, but uh, Meech kind of was carrying the load, I would say, for a lot of the late game here for CLG. Got super far ahead. It was just able to translate that. Game number two was an absolute blast. Now, FlyQuest was able to take game number two, but it was not easy. Very back and forth. We ended up going to second Elder. FlyQuest is able to grab that. They're able to win the game off of that. Very, very fun. A really good game from Spirax, I would say, in game number two to kind of uh, push forward FlyQuest. Everybody kind of played well in game number two. I'm going to give my dud of the series, unfortunately, to Yuji. Uh, he was actually really solid in game number two, incredibly influential towards the back half, but his game number one was really bad. He certainly had the worst game of any of the 10 players, in my opinion, which was that game number one on Vi. Yuji has honestly been a little disappointing for me so far this year. I was really hoping that he was going to be able to take that next leap. Him and Spirax showed a ton of synergy at the end of last year. You're bringing Philip back in. Also, credit to Philip. He was super far down in game number two. He was like 0-4 at like 15 minutes, and he he does a really good job of bouncing back and having a really good late game, but I was really hoping those three on the top side would really come together and make FlyQuest, you know, a team to be reckoned with, like a top three-ish team in uh, NACL this year. Just really hasn't happened. Yuji has not taken that step up. I think Sparax has been good, but Yuji really hasn't taken that step up, and uh, I think the series was a good encapsulation of that. Honestly, in my opinion, he was just outplayed by Kevy in, especially in game number one, but even in game number two, outside of the smites, I thought Kevy did a good job with jungle control. So, overall, for both of these teams, you know, splitting one-to-one -one at FlyQuest and CLG, not particularly surprising. I think they, I have them back-to-back -back in my power rankings. If not back-to-back, -back, they are incredibly close and they have been all year long. I see these two teams basically in the same exact mold, the same exact spot. They're both good teams, teams that are going to be somewhere in between like five and eight, I would say, um, but not necessarily teams that I would expect to be competing for like top three, or at least they haven't shown to have the, the consistency and the level to be able to compete for top three. I think both have the talent to do so. Like I said, Meech and Breezy seem to get better every single week, and Copy really is a superstar at this level. He's one of the best players in the NACL, or at least he has been up until this point in the season. And then for FlyQuest, if you can just get that young core to develop, I do think that you can get there. My problem is just that I don't think either team has necessarily reached it right now, and I think that's definitely shown off by both teams kind of tying here, even if CLG does look a tad bit better. So overall, I think both teams are fine, but... Uh, not necessarily two teams that I would expect to be uh, competing for the top title spot. And then moving on to our second series here of day number one, of course, still in that first bracket, 
We had a, a matchup between two pretty, pretty big organizations, I would say, here in North America. We had TSM Challengers taking on Team Liquid Challengers. And uh, really, to nobody's surprise, Team Liquid was able to pick up the 2-0 series win here. Uh, they just look like the better team. Team Liquid has looked incredibly consistent through the first part of this split. And honestly, I think in comparison to a lot of the teams that are kind of below them or above them, their consistency definitely stands out. Even some of the better teams in the league, uh, you know, teams that I have above them in my power rankings, certainly have not shown the same level of consistency that TLC has over the first couple of games. And that absolutely continues here with a 2-0 win. And I think, you know, a lot of it's on the back of their, uh, quite frankly, their young players. I feel like that they really had a nice mix of young and veteran players on this TLC roster, you know, bringing in Arrow, bringing in Mirror, you know, a lot of players that have had a, a decent amount of experience at this level. I really do think it's the young players and most specifically the solo laners for me on TLC that have really stepped up. You know, Bradley's obviously been great for quite a while now. He was awesome in amateur before he ever got to uh, Academy you know, back when he was a mid laner instead of a top laner, but he switches the top lane to get into Academy, plays for TLA last year, and is really, really solid. One of the better top laners in the entire league. And then this year you bring an APA, obviously another ridiculously hyped up mid lane prospect to get that mid lane job here. And he has been spectacular. He's genuinely been phenomenal for this TLC team. He's getting a series here. He was better in game one, but he was specifically better in game number two. We'll talk about Doxa in a bit, but he was just outclassing him. And Doxa is honestly somebody who's had moments so far here in the NACL, and so it was really impressive to see APA step up, have a really, really good game, and or a couple of really good games, and, and kind of continue the trend that he has been on all year long already, which is that of a very strong laner in the mid lane, someone who can actively carry his team to be one of the best teams in the league. I think Arrow and Kim Down have really worked together incredibly well in the bot lane. They've been very consistent, even though they weren't the big focuses of this game. I think that they were fantastic last week. That carried over here. Bradley's been good. Mir has kind of been the weak link of the team, ironically enough, but I don't know if that's going to last forever. He's been fine. As for TSM, we just kind of know what they are at this point. They are a team that is probably going to be able to beat the lower tier teams, you know, our our actual LCS sponsored uh, provisional teams here, you know, TL First, CLG Faith, FlyFam, etc. Like, they should be able to beat those teams relatively consistently. Hell, they should even be able to keep their pace with teams like AoE Gold, you know, you know, teams in that zone, Immortals, the Challengers that we've seen, but they're probably not a team that is going to be competing for top six. They're just not really in that zone. They don't really have the cohesion that they need there. Drag Coup is finally in. He's actually here, so no more rocks in the support position. Wild Turtle and Drag Coup actually played okay together. I thought Wild Turtle had one of his more interesting series of the year, but the rest of the team just did not hold up, most specifically this jungle mid duo uh, and Doxa in the mid lane, who just got outplayed by APA, like, heavily. This is uh, Doxa going to be getting my dud of the series here. He's had some good series so far, but I was pretty low on him going into the year, and he's been very up and down for this TSM team. It very much looks like he is going to go with the ebb and flow of how the rest of this roster is doing. When the rest of this roster is playing well, he's going to look really, really good. When the rest of this roster is not doing well, I don't think he's going to look particularly good, especially when going up against a mid laner as good as APA. That just seems to be what TSM is right now. I do think that Hauntzer is easily the best player on this team still in the top lane, but there really is so much you only so much you can do. Sven Skarin's not been very good. Wild Turtle's been ridiculously inconsistent, and they finally got their starting support. And so overall, TSM Challengers just feels like a meh team that definitely has ways to win games, but I doubt is ever going to be pushing for one of the top spots in the NACL. TLC, on the other hand, very much is in that conversation. I think they're right around that top three, top four, potentially even top two conversation, especially with how things are going to break down later on this week. TLC is definitely a team to keep an eye out for. Their young talent is really breaking through, and I think that, you know, leads to good things. I don't know what their idea is for the future. I don't know if they're entirely ridiculously locked to this, you know, full Korean team on the main roster, but, you know, APA versus Harry, I think that could be a really interesting debate as we go further on down the year, but for now, TLC is just playing really well, and you just hope that they're able to keep that up. Then moving on to our third series here, we had a matchup between 100 Thieves Challengers and Team Liquid first, and it went just about as you would expect. This was pretty dominant on the side of 100 Thieves. They are by far the better team, and they absolutely proved it here. They dominated Game 1, they dominated Game 2. It wasn't particularly close in either uh, aspect, pun entirely intended here, which we will get to in a second, but let's talk about 100 Thieves first. They just continue to look really, really good for this level. I know they really started the year struggling to win a series. I think they started 0-3-0 with just a bunch of 1-1s, but they were the better team in almost every single series that they played, even against some really good teams that they were able to go 1-1 with, but unfortunately, they just were never able to actively win two games in a row until the end of last week, but uh, they finally did another one here. You're now sitting at 2-3. I'm feeling a lot more comfortable about this team. 
uh, you know, everything that I've said about them up until this point in the season absolutely still stands here. There's a reason that they're top two in my power rankings. They were number two in my power rankings going into the week, and it's because they just have the best bot lane in the NACL, and it's not particularly close. Unforgiven's going to get my player of the series again. He's just too good for this level, and it is so clear to see. He is so much better than basically anybody else that he is playing against right now that it is almost frustrating that he has this spot in the first place. Him and Destiny, honestly, together have been fantastic. I want to give a lot of credit to Destiny as well. I know he gets a lot of shit, but I've always been much higher on Destiny than a lot of the consensus has, even back to his time on Origin, but most especially his time on Immortals. I felt like he got a really bad rap on a team that did overperform expectations. That team was top six, and they had absolutely no right to be that season. And, um, you know, credit to Destiny. I do think that he has just not necessarily been given the right break. And hopefully, you know, maybe he gets another shot at the LCS level, you know, with Unforgiven. I think that could be a really, really fun partnership at, at some level. There are a lot of teams right now where I think that would absolutely be a very simple upgrade in the bot lane. Unfortunately, Unforgiven being an import does complicate some things for some of the bottom teams, but there are definitely options. There are definitely uh, teams in the region that I think could definitely upgrade by just slotting in Unforgiven and Destiny into that bottom lane. So they continue to be really good. And then I want to give a big shout out to Yukino in this series. Uh, I thought he was really, really good. He's someone who I think has been getting better series after series. I was very concerned about him going into the year. Obviously, someone who, you know, one of the youngest players in the entire league and really hadn't proven much was on EG Prodigies, a team that I was notoriously low on when it came to the amateur improving ground scene. And so a lot of question marks coming out from Yukino coming in and immediately being the jungler for a team that was stacked with talent around him. But he, it really does feel like he is getting better, which is the, the mark of you know, progress is, is a good thing here in, in the NACL. I don't necessarily just want to see you be better immediately. It honestly fills me with more confidence to see you struggle at first, kind of like Yukino did, kind of be the, the piece on this team that didn't necessarily click at first and now, uh, you know, slowly starting to become a lot more comfortable with the team, a lot more comfortable with the competition and really be able to dominate. Those three players in particular, I thought were really good for 100 Thieves in this series. And then for TL first, it's just unfortunate. It does feel like some of their players are just quite frankly outmatched at this level, most specifically Aspect. I think this is the third time in a row that I've now given him dud of the series. It might only be the second, I don't remember, but he really is proving to be one of, if not the weakest mid laner in the NACL right now. It's unfortunate. I was very concerned about Aspect going into the year, if only for the fact that we hadn't seen him play competitively in over a year. Obviously, he was on that EG Prodigies team, but it was back in 2021. He didn't play competitively in 2022, immediately gets this spot on TL first, and I was just interested to see what we were going to get out of him. Unfortunately, he has been not so good for, for TL first. I know going into pretty is very difficult, and it's definitely tough when the rest of the team isn't playing particularly well around you. Game number one in particular, City Witty in the jungle was just atrocious, had zero pressure, was able to do basically nothing on the map, but Aspect was really bad in both games, and I thought City Witty had a much better game number two, and so... It was just a pretty easy choice for me to select Aspect as dud of the series again here. I just think outlook-wise, TL First is just kind of in that cluster of bottom three teams. Again, it's them, it's CLG Faith, it's FlyFam. I do think they're probably the best of that group, if only because they have Surdy in the top lane, who I think is clearly the best player out of those three teams right now, but... Um, their jungle mid duo is incredibly weak or has been incredibly weak up to this point. Their bot lane really hasn't separated themselves in any meaningful way from anybody else in the league. Uh, I just don't really see a world in which TL first is anything other than like a bottom three team in the league right now. And, and moving forward, they, it pretty, it is in my opinion, pretty clear to separate the bottom three from everybody else. And, uh, they unfortunately fall into that, even if they are at the top of it, but for hundred thieves, they continue to look really good. Another series win here is going to keep them, you know, pretty high up in the power rankings. Obviously, Unforgiven and Destiny just look so ridiculously good. If Yukino can continue to get better, Pretty, you know, has started to get a little bit more accustomed to, I think, playing with this team. Sniper was really solid to start the year and then took a, a much more decreased role, which honestly encourages me quite a bit. It's good to see him be able to play without resources as well. And I just think 100 Thieves is kind of clicking on all cylinders right now. So really, really like what they were able to do in 2023 so far. Then we get to our fourth series of the day, and this is the one that I think everybody wants to hear about. We, of course, have Cloud9 Challengers taking on Wildcard Gaming, and Wildcard with an absolutely massive 2-0 win over what many presumed to be the best team in the NACL in Cloud9, me included. I had them at number one in my power rankings going into this week, and Wildcard honestly winning both games and looking good doing it. Now, I gotta be a little bit hesitant about how I talk about this, because Wildcard's gonna have some awesome fans, and I really respect it. Moose Hater, in particular, is a very fun player, and he was awesome in game number two, but we gotta talk about game number one. 
How the hell did Wildcard win game number one? That felt like it should not have happened. Not only did Moose Hater get absolutely destroyed in the top lane, but it felt like basically everybody was losing, maybe with the exception of Lens and Duo King in the bottom lane, where Wildcard was really able to stay afloat in that game, and they were able to pull it back, and then some crucial objective gets, some crucial team fight wins. They're able to pull the game out, being down, you know, 12 kills at the end of the game. Really, really impressive stuff. Coming out from wildcard, way to be resilient, but it is worth noting that, you know, a lot of the players that did end up playing well in that game were on the side of Cloud9. Um, and then game number two, this was wildcard. I mean, this is the wildcard showcase. Moose Hater getting the Garen, absolutely popping off. Flame Horizoning, Fate God, in the top lane here on the Garen, absolutely destroying him. Saligo looking great on the Jace into what many people presume to be the best player in the NACL and Eminus right now. Really just an incredibly impressive performance coming out from Wildcard, and they deserve this win. I don't want it to seem like I'm trying to take away from the 2-0 by saying that game number one, they had absolutely no business winning. But truthfully, game number one, they had absolutely no business winning. My player of the series was incredibly tough to give out here because I don't think that anybody played well in both games. I really don't think that there was a single player across the series that felt like, yeah, you know what, they were the middle ground. Like, they played well in both games. I think the closest that I could find was Saligo in the mid lane. He was okay in game number one, especially towards the back half on that Azir. I think without the damage that he was able to offer in some of those team fights, that game would have been completely and utterly doomed. But game number two on the Jace was really, I think, where he stood out, where he was really, really fun to watch. I still think Moose Hater was more impactful in game number two. And don't get me wrong, Moose Hater fans, I definitely understand that he was the player of the game in game number two. The problem was he was a problem in game number one on that Fiora, where he just got destroyed by Fate God on that Gnar. He was not impactful really at all throughout that game. And so it was really hard for me to give him player of the series when half of the games in the series, he was bad, and I felt like Saligo was kind of the middle ground. I think you could realistically give this to Lens in the AD carry spot as well, who had a really good game number one, but I didn't think he was impactful really at all in game number two. It really was the top side of the map that really took over for wildcard in that second game. So for me, Saligo playing as well as he did on that Jason game number two, especially into Eminus, who most people consider to be the best mid laner in the region, me included, I think was the impressive part, and that would, that's what gave me the confidence to give him player of the series. And then for Cloud9, you're going to be frustrated that you weren't able to win a game here. I think, you know, winning that first game would have went a long way to making the series feel like it was a lot closer, but you weren't able to do that. Unfortunately, I have to give dead of the series to somebody on the side of Cloud9 because they really did disappoint and they deserved it, quite frankly. So it's going to go to Fate God. He was good in game number one on the NAR. I thought he outplayed Moose Hater, but that game number two was miserable from him. He got Flame Horizoned in that game and it wasn't particularly competitive from him. He just kind of got outplayed. I do think he's still a good player. I don't think this is particularly indicative of where he is in the rankings. I still think he's probably like a top five or six top laner in the region right now. Someone who is incredibly solid for a solid team, but I really don't think anybody else on this Cloud9 team underperformed all that much. I thought bot lane was fine. I thought Eminus was fine. Certainly his weakest games of the split, in my opinion, but you know, that, that's saying, you know, quite a, not really saying quite a bit because his games have been fantastic so far. And I think Tomio had some moments where he looked good, where he was able to keep up and, you know, especially in game one, keep the game relatively relevant in favor of Cloud9. And so for me, it's going to go to Fake God just for how bad his game two was. But for Cloud9, generally speaking, you're going to be frustrated that you lost this 0-2. It's your first series loss of the year and it's to a provisional team. It's not really what you wanted. You ego checked Moose Hater here. You gave him the Garen and he punished you for it. And uh, that's really the takeaway here is if you would have dropped the ego, you probably would have won, but you didn't. So you lost. Uh, for wildcard, you did everything you wanted to do. Your solo laners still look good. I think your bot lane in particular also looked really, really good here. And this team plays with such energy and such fire and they're so fun to watch that honestly, it's just kind of a blast to have them in the, uh, in the NACL. And I really, really hope that they can continue to beat some of the top teams like they have here. And then moving into our final block of games here on day one, our fifth series is a matchup between Immortals Challengers and AoE Gold, and it's a 1-1, but I'll actually say AoE looking pretty good in this series, especially compared to how they looked last week. I was really concerned about this team. I was starting to get worried that they weren't exactly like a top 10-ish team in the league, and I'm still not exactly sure they're right there. It's not like Immortals are the best of competition, and to be able to draw 1-1, you know, you would have hoped to be able to take a 2-0 against a team like Immortals, but Immortals could probably say the same thing about AoE. I think both of these teams kind of walking out 1-1 just kind of reaffirms where they were, you know, kind of outside that top 10 in my power rankings last week, but my player of the series is actually going to go to Darkwings on the side of AoE. I actually think 
AOE played relatively well across both games. Uh, Immortals played really well in game number two, and they had a pretty awful game number one. But for AOE in particular, I actually think Dark Wings played really, really solid across both games. And that's good to see. I was starting to get a little bit concerned about these solo laners. They were very hit or miss. When it came to AoE's games so far this season, I think obviously the Soul Laners have been a little more hit and miss than, you know, Winnie, who's just kind of been eh, uh, Lynx and Skytech, who have had moments but really have mostly just been eh. I think that when they win, like Darkwings and Gamsu often look pretty good, and that was kind of the case in this series. I thought both of them had pretty good series. Gamsu absolutely outplayed ADD. We'll get to that in a bit, but Darkwings is going to get my player of the series. Obviously, I've been very high on Darkwings for quite a while. I got very familiar with him on Dignitas last year, and I honestly think that he has exceeded my expectations in pretty much every aspect every single time I've seen him. If he can just land that consistency, perhaps, you know, get a get on a better page with this jungler and Winnie, who I just, I don't think they've necessarily had the best of chemistry all year long. I think if those two things can happen, he could legitimately be like a top, you know, five, six-ish mid laner in the NACL. I don't think it's happening right now. I certainly don't think he's at that level at the moment, but I definitely do think he has the talent to do so. Like I said, Gomsu was also good. And uh, Lynx and Skytech had moments where they were solid in the series as well. Winnie was very up and down. Two games of Elise. Had a very good game number one when they lost and a very bad game number two. Or when they won, I should say, uh, and had a very bad game number two when they lost. So, for Immortals... Uh, there's really not a lot of takeaways here for me. I think that the players that we thought were going to do well did well, and the players that we didn't think were going to do well didn't do well. I think really the big takeaway is that Chad was a lot better in this series. He's someone who I think was quite poor to start the season, but has slowly started to get better, I think, as games have progressed. I still think the top side of this map is a little bit questionable, but I think Chad and Balulu are getting on the same page uh, more so than they were at the beginning of the year. Balulu was really good in game number two, easily the player of the game in game number two, in my opinion, for that win. I thought Wixie was a lot better, but... Really, in my opinion, this loss is almost squarely on the shoulders of ADD, who just continues to be literally nothing in the top lane. I mean, even Gamsu was completely running him over, and we've talked about how Gamsu has certainly been an up-and-down threat over the course of the last few weeks, and so when Gamsu was beating you up in the top lane, I mean, ADD has just been a complete disaster for this Immortals Challengers team, and he continues to be the biggest problem, the biggest negative on this team, in my opinion, but overall, where do these two teams stand? Well, it's I'm going to kind of group them together here, because I think both teams are relatively in the same spot, or at least comparatively in the same spot as they were a week ago where I really felt that while both can compete at this level, while both can kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the lower tier top 10 teams, you know, teams like, you know, TSM Challengers or, or teams kind of in that uh, vein right now, I don't think either of them are really top 10 in that sense. I think they are, you know, sitting on the outside. AoE Gold and Immortals Challengers both similar, sitting somewhere around 11, sitting somewhere around 12, you know, 13, in that range, both mad teams that I think are really going to be looking to, you know, continue to improve. I think for Immortals, you're looking for your jungle to really step up. Obviously, you're hoping top lane can, but it hasn't really been happening. And then bot lane to get more consistent for AoE. I think you're just looking for jungle in particular, but then also your solo laners to just have the better performances that they have all the time instead of once every three series or something like that. And so overall, I think both teams are relatively in a similar spot. Not particularly surprised to see this go 1-1. And that's going to bring us to our final series here of day number one, which was another one that I'm really, really excited to talk about. We had Evil Geniuses Challengers taking on the Cincinnati Fear, and the Fear keep the train rolling. Not only was Wildcard able to take down C9 earlier, but the Fear are able to take down Evil Geniuses. That is absolutely massive. Both of these provisional teams continue to perform way above expectation levels, and let me say... This series was not C9 versus Wildcard. This was not C9 throwing away game number one and then Wildcard winning game number two. This was the fear winning both games, like definitively winning both games by looking like the better team. I've already praised quite a few players on this fear team throughout the year, most notably Perry and Shochi, who I've been very high on. But truthfully, I think I've hit a point where I now truly know who the best player on this team is, and that is Trevor in the support position. I mean, he is just a difference maker in every single game that the Fear plays. He has been phenomenal. He's going to get player of the series again. I'm not sure if it's just the meta that we're in right now that really favors him, but this is not the Trevor that I saw last year when I was doing research for the NACL at the beginning of the year. Trevor was a good player, but he certainly wasn't this. I mean, he has come into the NACL and very potentially been the best support in the entire league. I mean, him and Destiny are right up there, you know, fighting with each other, in my opinion, but he heavily outplayed Smoothie in this series, and it was very impressive. Obviously, it is worth noting, EG did have Ryoma back in here in the mid lane, but Mobility is still in the bot lane. King is not back yet, so they still don't have their full roster, even in week number three here, but 
For the fear, I think Trevor really did a great job of being able to control the lane 2v2. He did a great job of transitioning leads that the fear had in the bot lane into the mid game and pushing that forward. In my opinion, a very worthy, deserving person of player of the series. And he just continues to be a huge positive for the fear. I think him and Perry are definitely fighting it out for most influential player on the fear overall, but Trevor is very quietly and very quickly shooting up that list for me. I really, really like how he's been playing. Again, really good series from Shochi. He was the other one that I almost considered here for player of the series. Ryoma came back in and was honestly fine. Certainly had some good games, especially in game number two. I thought Ryoma was relatively good, but um, for the most part, Shochi was also good. I thought Shochi in the mid lane has continued to very much impress. Those are the three players on the fear that have really made me consider this team to be relatively top tier. I think Perry, Shochi, and Trevor are all playing like top tier players right now. Manui still has a lot to show me. I think Faisal's really good in the top lane, but those three players, I think in particular, are top of the league in terms of how they are playing right now. They are top, you know, three, four, five players at their position in the entirety of the NACL. And uh, I'm very, very impressed with how the Fear have been playing, and I just hope that they can keep it up. And then for Evil Geniuses, this is not a very good showing. I mean, this is a team that I am still hanging on to hope is going to be good once they get their full roster, but they are not looking great. I know Shaden had a phenomenal week last week. He was player of the week easily, absolutely dominated basically everybody he ran into, but he still is Shaden. He's still going to be a little bit up and down, a little bit uh, feast or famine. He feasted a lot last week. This was a little bit more of a famine kind of week. He played harder competition in the form of Perry, and Perry did a really good job of being able to contain him, and then that allowed Trevor to just kind of dominate in the bot lane matchup, and bot lane really was a problem for Evil Geniuses. Both Mobility and Smoothie had very, very poor series in both games here. I think you could give Dud of the series to either, but I'm going to give it to Smoothie. It felt like he had basically no impact on either of these games, and I think that that's definitely unfortunate. Smoothie is someone who I was pretty high on at the end of last year. It felt like he kind of got closer back to that form that we knew from him in the LCS. He was a decent player, um, but it's kind of all fallen apart playing with mobility through the beginning part of this year so far. Not to say that it's mobility's fault. I'm just saying that whatever Smoothie was, you know, kind of progressing back to towards the end of last year, it feels like he's regressed back to what he was at the beginning of 2022 uh, before he got that job back from Skytech on Evil Geniuses Academy. So not a great showing from him. Mobility is just not great at this level. He's not bad. There are certainly worse AD carries at this level than mobility, but uh, I don't think he's necessarily somebody who's going to be on like a top three team at this level. And then honestly, Soul was probably it's probably Soul's worst series of the year as well up in the top lane. Just kind of got outplayed by Faisal, who has really just genuinely been able to outplay most people this year. Very impressive from him. But overall, the Fear are a top three, four team in Academy, in NACL. There really is nothing else I can say at this point. They are, they have proven everything. They continue to grow. They continue to get better. Hopefully that only continues as the season goes on. And then for Evil Geniuses, at some point, I'm going to have to start pulling the plug on calling them one of the best teams in Academy. I know I don't have their full roster yet, but it's not the, the fill-in players that are really underperforming right now. It was Soul and Smoothie in particular in this series. And so hopefully Evil Geniuses can finally live up to their potential. But right now it just feels like Shaden either wins the game for them or they lose. There really is no in-between. All right, that's going to wrap up day number one. But now we can move on to day number two. And day number two was a pretty interesting one. Not nearly as explosive as day number one in terms of upsets, but certainly some high profile matchups to talk about. Starting off with the top team facing a bottom team, as we saw Dignitas Challengers taking on FlyFam. And Dig Challengers, pretty clean win, 2-0. Not particularly surprising here. This is one of the best teams in the NACL, taking on one of the worst teams in the NACL. FlyFam is making an adjustment here. Goo is out in the jungle. He'd actually been playing okay, I would say, through their first couple of games. I think FlyFam had a lot of problems. I'm not sure Goo was the biggest one. Uh, I talked about that a lot on the channel. You know, Lunasia hasn't exactly been great on the top side. And honestly, the bot lane has been incredibly disappointing on the side of FlyFam. But... You know, Goo getting replaced here by Maniac, someone who doesn't really have a ton of competitive experience, especially at a super high level. Did play for Wildcard last year, but uh, was just in the uh, qualifiers for the NACL uh, on the Northern Front. That team was okay, I guess, kind of meh. Don't really know all that much about Maniac. This is really my first big introduction to him as a player this series, and it didn't particularly go well as FlyFam do kind of get run out of the building by a very good Dig Challengers team. Player of the series, pretty easy choice for me. Gonna go to XU, was just enabling everybody on this team, was dominating the jungle matchup, completely controlled the map, was involved in basically everything that Dignitas wanted to do in this series, and it absolutely showed through. 
Obviously, he wasn't the only one on Dignitas to play well. You have to shout out Insanity in this series. He pulls out the Udir mid in game number one and goes like 5-0-2. Absolutely Chad move there to go into Blaze, who I think has been FlyFam's best performing member by a considerable amount this year. And uh, just kind of dominate him on Udir mid. I mean, complete troll, but it works out. So what are you going to say? And then, of course, I think everybody else on the team played well. Hoon continues to be fine. And then this bot lane just continues to be solid as well. Not necessarily dominant, just solid. Certainly, um... One of the more consistent bot lanes, I would say, in the NACL. Not not one that I think would be competing to, like, dominate teams, unless you're talking about some of the worst teams in the league, but certainly not one that you're ever going to feel bad about having on your team. So Dignitas continues to look good. FlyFam continues to look bad. Even with the change in the jungle, I would argue that it hurt them a little bit more, at least in the short term. Maniac did not look like he was on the same page as basically any of his teammates here. I thought Goo and Blaze actually had a relatively interesting synergy together in that jungle mid duo. That is now gone. Maniac and Blaze had almost no chemistry this game. Maniac got jungled off the map by XU, which is fine. I'm not going to overreact. This is somebody who just recently stepped into the team probably hasn't had that much time to actually practice and train and scrim along with the rest of these players so I'm not going to freak out and you're also going against one of the best teams in the NACL so you know kind of a tough game to throw yourself into but Maniac is definitely deserving of done of the series here I mean just completely had no pressure in either game fly fam was playing on the back foot basically for moment one in both now that there were a lot of reasons for that, I thought Blaze was pretty bad in the mid lane. Like I said, him and Maniac didn't particularly have a great synergy together. And I said Lunasia in the top lane has been a little bit of a problem for FlyFam when you're losing as hard as you are to Hoon. That is definitely a little bit of an issue. But overall, I would say the jungle matchup was really where I felt the biggest impact in this series where Dignitas was able to generate a pretty gigantic lead over a team like FlyFam. So XU player of the series, Maniac out of the series, FlyFam continues to look like in my opinion, one of, if not the weakest team in the NACL, certainly uh, up there in that conversation. They just don't really have a lot of avenues that they can play through. Blaze has had some moments where he's looked really good, but, you know, changing out jungles, he didn't look particularly good in this series, which means that I don't really see a big avenue for them to be able to win games. Instinct should be that for this team. He just simply has not been that over the course of their first few games. He has regressed so much from 2022 that it's almost astounding, so... Flyfam continues to be a problem. Dignitas continues to be great. Now, I do want to make something clear. Uh, Dignitas is a very good team. A lot of people are probably wondering why I don't have them in my top two or three going into this week. And I have to note that while Dignitas has been very good, they really haven't played a lot of the best teams. They went one and one against Cloud9, which is a really, really good draw. But no 100 Thieves series yet. No Team Liquid series yet. I really want to see how they're going to do against some of the other top teams in the region right now or in the NACL, even like Wildcard or a team like the Cincinnati Fear. Like, I'm really interested to see how Dignitas is going to do against some of the other teams that are really streaking and really doing well right now. They have done a very good job of beating up on some of the lower teams and some of the mid teams in the league, but it's definitely going to be interesting to see if they can do the same against some of the better teams. I still think they are incredibly talented, but it's just kind of hard for me to call them the best team in the NACL. No brainer, just because they've been able to beat FlyFam and TL Faith and teams like that. They have had some good series against like C9 and CLG uh, challengers, which I think really are their big ones, but I, I just, before I consider them easily the best team in Academy, I want to see them be able to, you know, take on and maybe beat a team like 100 Thieves Challengers, or maybe beat a team like Team Liquid Challengers. That's when I'm really going to start to consider them the best team in Academy or in NACL, but for now, they're just going to have to settle for being like a top three or four team in NACL, in my opinion. Then we move on to our second series here of day number two. We had TSM Challengers taking on Golden Guardians Challengers, and Golden Guardians absolutely blow them out of the water in both of these games. An incredibly good performance from Golden Guardians, who seemingly have only gotten better as the season has progressed. I was actually really concerned about this team at the start of the year after week one. They weren't looking particularly good. I think I had them out of my top 10 in my power rankings. I'm not exactly sure that I'm on that page anymore. Golden Guardians has really stepped it up, and I think it's really due to the fact that their top side has become significantly more stable because truly at the end of the day their carry roles have always been incredibly solid I think their bottom three players have always been some of the more interesting ones in the league Young jumped out to a fantastic start to the year at the beginning of the year I talked about that a ton in both weeks one and week two where I thought Young was easily the best performing member of this Golden Guardians Challengers team and that absolutely kept up here he had a good game one on the Silas but really this was the Cassidy in game two that really stood out to me where he was absolutely able to win that game for Golden Guardians and then Array really had a breakout week last week definitely in the running for player of the week 
last week, you know, along with Shade and Array was fantastic. And I think those two players have really separated themselves from a lot of their contemporaries at their positions. And they've really made Golden Guardians a team to be reckoned with. Prismal is an incredibly talented support. He hasn't necessarily had the same year this year that he had last year, in my opinion, but still been very, very good in that support position, has allowed Array to really look fantastic in that role has allowed him to look a lot better than, you know, he has looked in previous splits. I honestly think this bottom side of the Golden Guardians team has been incredibly impactful. When the top side plays stable and they just don't lose the game like they did in the series, Golden Guardians is actually one of the scarier teams in the NACL, in my opinion. But that is a big ask. Sometimes Concept and sometimes Rosethorn can be a little bit hit or miss. Concept in particular has been pretty miss over the course of this season and last season, but he was really good in this series. Honestly, matched up against a good top lane in Hauntzer relatively well and played him, you know, solidly. It certainly wasn't the big problem that he was earlier on in the season and Rosethorn had a good job, you know, keeping Sven's Garrett in check. And so when Golden Guardians' top side plays well, they seem to walk to a lot of these victories, especially against, you know, competition that might not be the best of the best. And that's kind of what TSM is right now. They really did not look good in this series. Sven Skarin's going to get my dud of the series in this one. He's kind of earned it in a couple of the other ones, but this one really stood out as being probably his worst series of the split so far. He was just awful in both games. He was able to get some stuff done in the early game of game number one, but game number two, he was completely useless on that Wukong, in my opinion. Him and Doxa, and Doxa especially in game number one, was atrociously bad. That jungle mid duo did not work here. Going up against a really good player and young, Doxa continued to struggle this week. He really has not had a great start to the week. Um, he had a couple of good games last week, but overall it's been kind of a, a down year, I would say, so far. I want to give him a little bit of leniency because, of course, he was thrust into this position, the starting role on TSM, you know, more uh, quicker than he probably expected to be, what with everything that happened with Triple. And, you know, I wanted to give him some time to settle in, but it's been three weeks now. He should have had some time to settle in. He's had some time to practice and scrim with the team. He should kind of be on the page now, and it really hasn't improved all that much. I had him as my last ranked mid laner going into the year. That certainly has not been the case in terms of how he has actually performed, but it is worth noting that you know, he's not this superstar mid laner that is going to carry them across the finish line. Sven Skarin certainly not helping him. Wild Turtle and Dragku were, again, bad in this series. TSM just kind of looks like they're floundering. Not necessarily a team that I'm going to expect to be finishing, you know, somewhere close to, like, top 7, top 8. Maybe they could fight for top 10. I don't think they're necessarily, like, that far out of that conversation, but... Golden Guardians was clearly better than them in this series, and it's not like Golden Guardians is the most dominant team in the world. They certainly have their own problems, but they were able to overcome them in this one to be able to take the win over TSM, which is a very good thing. Hopefully, Golden Guardians can continue to be this level of consistent, because if they can, they do have the talent to be like a top six or seven team in the NACL. I just don't know if I trust them enough right now to really like pitch my wagon on that idea. And then moving on to our third series, we had FlyQuest Challengers taking on CLG Faith. And again, another like top team facing a, a relatively bottom team here. Um, I should say a relatively top team facing a bottom team. That's probably more accurate as we had FlyQuest Challengers dominating this series and really just like absolutely destroying them, looking like the better team. We already talked about Dignitas versus FlyFam. I think this one might have been even worse in terms of just like utter destruction. Dignitas was better than FlyFam, but FlyQuest didn't allow anything to happen for CLG and they honestly looked really, really good doing it. This was a nice bounce back. I don't think they had a particularly bad day number one earlier this week, but I don't think it was necessarily up to the standards that they maybe wanted it to be. And this was a lot better. I think really for FlyQuest, what the difference is between winning against some of these bottom teams, you know, and, and dominating them and, and actually being competitive against some of the top teams for me comes down to just this bot lane, which has been very, very good in their wins and very irrelevant in their losses. And I do think that that is kind of the tipping point for FlyQuest overall. Masu is going to get my player of the series. He's gotten quite a few of these for FlyQuest challengers this year, more so than anybody else on the team. Yet I wouldn't consider him the best player on the team. I still would consider that to be Spearax in the mid lane because Masu definitely disappears during some of their losses. But when they win and when he looks good, when him and Kitong in the, in the support position really look solid together. I mean, this team looks unstoppable. Masu, when he's winning, looks unbelievably good. It's just the inconsistency that he has brought to the team through the first couple of games that has really started to make me question. Obviously, we're getting close to being halfway through the year already, or at least the split in terms of the NACL like regular season before we get to proving grounds and the playoffs and stuff. And so... Uh, Masu really performing well in their wins and not so well in their losses kind of paints a good picture for what this FlyQuest Challengers team is. 
Everybody on Fly C looked really good in this game. I don't want it to seem like anything else. Basically, everybody stomped. Yuji was obliterating them in the jungle. Philip obliterating in the top lane. Spirax obliterating in the mid lane. Bot lane was obliterating. Everybody was winning for FlyQuest. I just think Masu was a little bit more uh, aggressive and a little bit more involved, I would say, than a lot of the other players were in the win. He definitely knows when to step up and play incredibly aggressive, but that doesn't always translate to their losses. As for CLG Faith, I mean, right there with FlyFam is one of the worst teams in NACL. I mean, Bajani continues to be potentially the worst top laner in the NACL, which there is competition for right now. Uh, certainly, that is a role that I would say is uh, kind of up for grabs, what with ADD and Lunasia and a couple of players really other underperforming, I would say, at the start of the year. Uh, but Johnny's right up there with him. He got completely destroyed by Philip. Not particularly surprising. Philip is a very good player up on the top side, and Bajani, you know, not being able to hang with him isn't particularly against what we've seen from him early on in the season. But this just kind of goes for everybody on CLG Faith. Uh, nobody performed well. Like, it, it's just, it's hard to really look at this. Obviously, they went out and actually made a roster change. Plux is out. Uh, Sketch is going to be moving to support, which is what the original plan was with BMFX playing at the AD carry position, but BMFX is not playing here. They actually bring in Aaron, um, who, you know, a lot of people who are familiar with amateur should be familiar with. He's somebody who's played quite a while, and so bringing him in maybe adds a little bit more stability. I kind of like Plux as a player, but he was really, really bad to start the year, and if you did want to move Sketch to you know, support, I understand, wanting to make this move. It'll be interesting to see if this makes any changes after this week. It just certainly did not work in this series, but like I said earlier, um, you know, adding a new player can be a little bit difficult, like I said, for FlyFam. Mid-season, especially having like four or five days to scrim and get used to playing with the team can be very difficult, and so I'm not exactly expecting results immediately, especially because the rest of the team isn't exactly performing, but overall, CLG Faith still one of the worst teams in the league, right there with FlyFam. You know, TL First is kind of in that argument as well. We will get to them in a second, actually, because they definitely are looking better, I would say, than the other two. But, you know, CLG Faith, FlyFam really at the bottom of the barrel right now in terms of what they've been able to accomplish. And Fly Challenger's definitely taking advantage of that. I just want to see them be a little bit more consistent against some of the best teams in the league because that's really the only thing holding Fly Challengers back. And it's mostly this bot lane. If they can stay consistently fantastic, this team is definitely going to be a threat. But then we move on to an actual inter-squad friendly here. Of course, I already talked about this a week ago. We get a couple of these uh, every so often in the NACL, what with a couple teams having both the Challengers and an amateur team. And we had one here was we had TL Challengers taking on TL first. And you usually will see the Challengers team kind of dominate, really look like the better team and didn't really happen in this series. It actually split one-to-one. -one. TL first was able to pick up game number one. Pretty disastrous for TL challengers. Not exactly what you really wanted to see. A team that was really rolling up until this point, but it is worth noting they were the better team in both games. TL first just was able to kind of swing things back into their favor towards the back half of game number one. I think talking about challengers first and foremost, I think APA still looks like an absolute monster. He has looked like an absolute monster all split long. He is easily one of the top three, four, I would say top five no matter what players in the NACL right now. And that's just got to be a huge, great sign, not only to obviously Team Liquid fans and to the organization, but to North American fans who have just been talking about APA for what feels like seven years now, saying like, where is this guy at the academy level? He finally gets a shot at NACL on TL Challengers, and he's absolutely making the most of it. He looked fantastic in this series. Yes, he was going up against probably the worst mid laner in the NACL right now in Aspect, but he still looked pretty good doing it. I would say him, and as well as Arrow and uh, Kim Down, I thought looked really, really solid here. Arrow and Kim Down continue to have really nice synergy as a bot lane 2v2 early on in games I do think that they're able to generate a lot of leads early we saw a lot of engaged supports this weekend in the NACL which definitely surprised me but that carried over into this series and I actually think both of these sides played it relatively okay uh, for the most part though TL Challengers was much better at it especially the engaged support part of that uh, and their bot lane looking good. So APA and Arrow and then Kim Down. APA and Kim Down in particular, I think, are really looking fantastic for TL Challengers along with Bradley. Those are the three players that have really stood out to me uh, as kind of being surprisingly good uh, on TL Challengers. Not that I'm shocked that they're good at all, just that they've been really, really good. As for TL First, you actually were able to pick up a game against TL Challengers. That's absolutely huge for you. You're really not supposed to be able to beat your own organization's upper tier team. Like, that's the point, is they should be better than you in every role because they're the upper tier in your exact organization. So for you to be able to take game number one, I thought was really, really fun. Surdy continues to look really, really good. I really like him as a player, and he's kind of wasted, I hate to say it on this TL first team that just continues to struggle a bit. And then I actually thought, you know, Mia played relatively well in this series as well, considering the fact that Rovex was absolutely nowhere to be seen, especially on this Nautilus in game number two, where it was just like, 
Where are the engages? Like, what, what, what is happening? Be more aggressive. Go in and try to make plays. I know sometimes, you know, inflated KDAs can be a little bit of a problem both ways. You know, sometimes you can look really good by playing a more passive pick like Yumi KDA-wise. And sometimes you can look really bad by playing an engage support even when you are trying to make plays. But watching the games, it felt like Rovex was not actively involved in a lot of the success that TL First was creating, especially in Nabu. And so, definitely a little bit frustrating there. Rovex is going to get my dud of the series here and... Hopefully, Rovex can continue to improve. I actually think Mia has been relatively solid as an AD carry at this level, but Rovex has disappointed me a bit when it comes to the support position. Again, you know, kind of adding along to Aspect and City Witty, who I think all three of them just feel a tad bit overmatched at this level. Surdy's really good. Mia has had moments of being good. I think TL First Tier certainly has talent and certainly has ways to win games. I just don't know if I'm consistently going to believe that they're going to be able to do that. And then for TL Challengers, another solid series. You would have hoped to be able to take two games here, but at least you looked better than TL First in this series. It would have been absolutely disastrous if one of these games went very much in favor of TLF. That would have been uh, a pretty damning showcase, but at least APA and Kim Down, I think, are looking really, really good on the side of TLC, and hopefully you're going to be able to keep that up. Hopefully APA can continue to play at this MVP level pace that he has started the season on. And then moving on to our final bracket of games here on day number two, our final two. We started off with CLG Challengers taking on Wildcard Gaming. Obviously Wildcard coming off of a pretty fantastic win against Cloud9 earlier in the week. They split one-to-one -one with CLG. Certainly not a bad result. CLG certainly not a bad team by any stretch, but in my opinion, CLG definitely looking like the better team in this series. Wildcard had some moments uh, CLG just kind of not passing the ego check as per usual, as every team seems to not do against wildcard for some reason or another. I don't get it. Like, I know it's been talked about to death. I'm certainly not going to give you any sort of analysis that other content creators have not already given you. Hell, even LCS analysts are commenting on it at this point, but just ban Garen. Like, what are you doing? When you're going up against wildcard, simply ban Garen. He is so much different on Garen than he is on any other champion. You're going to lose to him on Garen. You just are. He's going to beat you. You put your ego aside and just ban the freaking champion. And uh, CLG does not do that in game number two. Uh, he gets out to like a, a 50 CS lead in the top lane and they're able to kind of compound that into a nice little Kindred Galio end game and be able to win from there. Really, really solid from wildcard. But CLG in game number one looked really solid. My player of the series is going to go to copy. He has been phenomenal for this CLG Challengers team. In my opinion, this is his best split so far in Academy and NACL, whatever you want to call the second tier of North America. This is his best split. I know he was really good on Cloud9, but he was never really the focal point quite like he is on CLG right now where he's being given all of the resources. He's being given the onus to carry a lot of these games and he's really succeeding in doing so. I really like Copy. I hope he continues to grow and, you know, he's a player that I think was already getting LCS offers or reportedly getting LCS offers this offseason. I imagine that will only go up with how he is playing right now in the NACL. Um, he wasn't the only player on the team to, you know, kind of make some plays, I would say. I would say in the first game... Jenkins obviously had a really fun performance on the Warwick, one of his signature picks, along with the Kennen. Uh, he was able to consistently invade Keel, really make his life a living hell because he had so much pressure over Moose Hater on the top side. You know, obviously things definitely switched up in game number two, but... Um, you know, one game, you know, the COG top laner gets his signature pick and dominates. The other game, the wildcard top laner gets his signature pick and dominates. Poor Keel really just had to sit there and take it in game number one. That's actually why he's going to get my dud of the series here. I actually think he played really well on the Kindred in game number two, but there wasn't a single player in this series that played bad both games. I actually think both players and both teams uh, really had a lot of uh, consistency through both of these games. I think both teams played relatively well. Even if Wildcard was definitely overmatched in game number one, I think a lot of the players that played poorly in game one definitely bounced back. Most notably that top side of Moose Hater, Keel, and then Saligo, who I think all kind of got bodied in game number one, all looked so much better in game number two. Saligo in particular, I actually really liked on the Galio, was constantly pushing ahead, constantly making really good plays, constantly supporting his jungle. I'm going to give it to Keel, just kind of, he got run over in game number one, not only due to Kevy and uh, but also due to Jenkins. I think that it was really just a bad game, but really it's kind of a weak dud of the series because I think Keel did play really well in game number two. Also worth noting, Kevy versus Keel, definitely a little bit of history. Both of them, you know, kind of playing for CLG at points, being the CLG Academy junglers. And so them playing off against each other, I think was fun, but I definitely think Kevy got the better of him in game number one, more so than Keel got the better of him in game number two, even though he did in my opinion. And so uh, that's going to be how player of the game, dud of the game shake out. Both of these teams are good. I don't know how good Wildcard is. That win over Cloud9 is definitely going to take some analyzing for me because while they did look really good, they were given a lot of what they wanted and also Cloud9 was better than them in game number one. And so I don't want to jump the gun on Wildcard. They really should be sitting here probably two, three, and one rather than three, two, and one. 
which is not a bad thing, still a very good record, but I hear a lot of people talking about them as a top one, two, or three team in the NACL right now. I'm not entirely sure I'm on board with that. They're definitely somewhere close to like top five, top six, but there's just a lot of competition at the top of the NACL right now, and it's going to take some thought to see if Wildcard joins that rank. CLG is a good team, but they're kind of in a similar boat. A good team that's not a great team. I have them right there with FlyQuest Challengers and with Wildcard, with a lot of these other teams that are good, but not necessarily teams that I consider a top one, two, three team in the league, right? Really, really solid, can beat basically anybody in the league, but definitely still has a ways to go. Both of these teams are solid, but it'll be interesting to see if either can grow into being one of the best teams in the league, because I just don't know if either are there right, right now. And then we get to move into our final series here of day number two, and it's the one that most people were looking forward to, I would say, going into this week. In my opinion, my most hyped series of the year so far. My number one and number two in my power rankings facing off. Cloud9 Challengers taking on 100 Thieves Challengers, and Cloud9 definitely looking better. I mean, they dominated both of these games, looking incredibly solid. 100 Thieves suffered their first loss of the year, their 0-2, their first 0-2 loss. Certainly not particularly surprising. Cloud9 is an incredibly strong team that does look incredibly fiery and you know I, I don't I don't really blame them for not being able to keep up with Eminus who just had another really good series he played Corky in game one and that's not a champion that you would particularly expect to be able to take over the mid game but he was just playing so aggressive playing with no fear and really going for a lot of these fights absolute same said about game number two here on the LeBlanc Eminus is really just good and, and th that's kind of where I'm at with him is he's just so much better than the talent that he's playing around him. My comparison for him and what I actually get reminded a ton of when I watch him play here in the NACL was watching Jojo Pune play in Academy a couple of years ago, back in 2021. Because I really do think it is incredibly similar. They're both incredibly talented young mid lane players that kind of just get by by skill and ego checking the enemy team. They don't really put a lot of respect. They are always going for plays, whether they're the right play to make or not, just assuming that they can get away with it by being the better player. That was my biggest complaint about JoJo when he got called up to the LCS a couple of years ago was I was really concerned with his macro play and how he was going to react to having to play against not only better mid laners in lane, but junglers who were going to capitalize on his positioning mistakes that he would make when he would step up a little bit too much. I think it's very similar with Eminus. When he plays a jungler that is willing to capitalize on him being incredibly aggressive and being incredibly pushed up, I do think it might be a problem. That was not this series. He went up against Yukino for 100 Thieves, who was kind of just jungled off of the map here. Tomio was so much better in the series, and Yukino easily had his worst series of the year. I was just talking him up earlier about how it felt like every single series for 100 Thieves, he was getting better and better and better. Well, that kind of took a little bit of a nosedive against Cloud9. Not the worst series to take a nosedive in. Certainly, bet, you know, worse teams to get absolutely destroyed. Destroyed by Cloud9, kind of destroys everybody, but Yukino was not good here. Very much dud of the series. I had no pressure the entirety of the series. Could not stop Eminence from getting ahead, and in fact, just gave Eminence a lot more gold in a lot of these cases trying to stop him. There are ways to be able to shut down a really strong mid laner that is consistently out of position. This was not it on the side of 100 Thieves. I would say overall... These two teams played relatively well. Eminus was great. I think Zazel has been phenomenal for Cloud9 Challengers. Again, another one of the best supports in the region. I think uh, Destiny on the side of 100 Thieves, Zazel and uh, Trevor have easily been the three best supports in the NACL, in my opinion, so far this year. Obviously, Diamond's kind of in that conversation as well, but those three have really stood out to me as some fantastic supports. Um, and then, uh, like I said, Tomio also looking incredibly good in this series. I would say 100 Thieves, definitely a little bit of panic. Uh, not that this is a bad loss, because again, it's the number one team in my power rankings, but you would have hoped to have been able to at least stay competitive. Even if you lost 0-2, you would have hoped to have looked relatively okay. You did not look relatively okay. Bot lane survived, I would say, in a lot of these games, but topside did not. Sniper got outplayed by Fate God pretty heavily, in my opinion. Obviously, Yukino got outplayed by Tomio, and Pretty got outplayed by Eminus. That top side of the map definitely crumbled a bit on the side of 100 Thieves, and you're definitely going to look for them to hopefully wrap things around. We know that the bot lane for 100 Thieves can be good. It's the rest of the team that we need to see step up in order for me to consider them one of the best teams in the NACL. And then for Cloud9, this is exactly what you wanted to see after a, you know, pretty desperate 0-2 loss to Wildcard earlier in the week. This is the kind of bounce back you needed to see. You needed to see Eminus be able to try and skill check his opponent after, quite frankly, losing against Saligo in the 1v1 
uh, earlier in the week. You wanted to see Fake God have a nice bounce back. He was much better than Sniper. You wanted to see Tomio look good. He was pretty good in this series. And then the bot lane was fine. Zazel looks really, really good as support in the 2v2. I think that's really his specialty. Can still play a lot of these engagers, a lot of these roam picks, but I think he definitely specializes in the 2v2, and I think Lost is definitely looking a lot better because of it. Overall, Cloud9 looking really, really, really good and a lot better than their series earlier in the week against Wildcard, even if they did look pretty solid in that game number one. I think Cloud9 is going to get a bad rap for losing that series, but for the most part, I think they've been pretty good this week. And then moving on now to day number three, our final day of NACL action here in week three. Got six more games to cover. I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. I don't think I'll be able to make it under an hour, but it'll be pretty freaking close. And so I hope you guys are willing to sit through me on that one. Kicking off our day three games, we had the Cincinnati Fear taking on AOE Gold. And the Fear are able to pick up another 2-0 win. I mean, this team continues to look fantastic. They just continue to outpace a lot of the competition that is around them in the league right now. Obviously, AOE Gold not necessarily a top team in the league, but the Fear taking care of them nonetheless is still a good sign. AOE definitely less of pushovers than I would say some of the other bottom teams are right now. And the Fear looked really solid. I know I already hyped him up a ton earlier this week, but I have to do it again here because my player of the series is again going to go to Trevor. He has just been fantastic out of that support position. It basically doesn't really matter what he's playing. It's mostly these more marksman-oriented supports, but he's also fantastic on the enchanters, things like the Lulu, things like the Nami. It doesn't particularly matter what he's willing to pull out in the meta right now. It's all kind of working for him, and it's certainly all working for the Cincinnati Fear. I would say Manui had a really good series here, much better than I think they have been having over the first couple of weeks. Uh, not that Manui has been a problem. I certainly don't think anybody on the fear has been a problem. Everybody's kind of been playing really well. You can't be a top team when you have, you know, someone playing really bad on the team. I don't think anybody's been bad, but I think Manui's probably been the weak link, I would say, overall of fear so far. I don't think that was the case in this series at all. The bot lane generally for fear was dominating the 2v2, able to get some early leads, and Manui actually did a fantastic job of positioning and being able to translate that lead into the late game. The other player for the fear that I want to shout out here is going to be Faisal in the top lane. Uh, Gamsu goes back and forth whether he's good or bad. Fortunately, he was good earlier in the week, and so he's going to be bad in this one. It's kind of what happened here. Faisal was fantastic, especially in that game number one, but it's a really good win for fear because... You're looking at this team and you're like, okay, well, yes, Perry and Shochi and Trevor have been really good. We're now looking at a win over an AoE gold team that isn't exactly the biggest pushover in the world. And doing it while Perry and Shochi are kind of the two members of the team that got the least amount of resources and the least amount of effort. That's fantastic. And that's a really good sign for the fear overall. As for AoE gold meh, eh, like, we just know what they are. They are a lower mid-tier team. They're a team that's going to be competitive with, you know, TSM Academy, or, sorry, TSM Challengers, and Immortals Challengers, and, you know, teams like that, but they're not going to be able to beat, you know, the best teams in the league. They're not going to be able to hang, and that's what Cincinnati Fear is. They're one of the best teams in the league, and AoE just was not able to hang. Skytech is going to get my dud of the series. It really is noticeable when other supports go up against Trevor because he's just able to outpace them so much early on into the game, be able to get his AD carry so many resources and really just kind of snowball the game out of control. It really is incredibly noticeable how the enemy supports just aren't able to do that. Whether it's on engagers or whether it's on enchanters, it doesn't particularly matter. Skytech was just not able to keep up with uh, with Trevor and with Manui in this game. And I think that was just the case for Lynx and Skytech in general for the most part of this week and for the most part of this year. Skytech, honestly, has been relatively disappointing for me this year. I think the bot lane really has not shown up all that much for AoE. I think the same case is to be made for the jungle position. Like I already said, when this team wins, it is likely the solo laners, and even then, they kind of got outplayed in this series against better competition. So, overall, AoE is exactly who we thought they were, probably sitting somewhere around number 13 in the power rankings, a team that can compete with, like, some of the lower tier, you know, mid-table teams, but is certainly not going to be pushing up for top six or really going to be competing with any of the teams in top six. And then for Fear, like, this team is genuinely, like, potentially top three, top four in the league right now. They are that good. They, in my opinion, are the best provisional team. I know a lot of people are going to say that Wildcard is better. I think Wildcard is better when they're on. I think they are more inconsistent than a team like Fear, who I can just see beating basically anybody in the league at any time. I'm really excited to see what happens when Fear starts playing off against some of the best competition in the league. You know, teams like 100 Thieves, teams like Cloud9. I'm going to be really excited to see those matchups because right now they really do look uh, as untouchable as anybody else in the league right now. 
And then moving on to our second series here of day number three, we had a battle between two teams that I'm relatively high on in Dignitas Challengers and Evil Geniuses Challengers, and Dignitas picks up a really nice 2-0 win here over Evil Geniuses. They still have not figured out what they want to do. They're now sitting at 2-2-3. I'm definitely starting to get out on the Evil Geniuses hype train that I've kind of been on. I'm not necessarily dead in the water with it yet, but I'm certainly starting to get concerned with how this team is playing. Um, but let's talk about Dignitas first, because it really does kind of go back and forth as to who the lead members of Dignitas are. I talked about this in Week 2 in particular, is I really wanted to see a lot of these players play well at the same time. And I think they've really started to do that. I think Dignitas has really started to come together as a group. It usually felt like either Jungle Mid was dominating or Bot Lane was dominating. This series was definitely more Bot Lane focused, but that doesn't mean that the Jungle and Mid were not doing well. I actually think they were really good in this series. And Dignitas has basically proven all of my doubts wrong. Tomo is going to get my player of the series here. But you could realistically give this to Diamond as well. Both members of the Bot Lane were really, really solid for Dignitas and definitely pushing the tempo forward. They just were so much better than Mobility and Smoothie, which we will get to in a bit, but that's really the kind of takeaway here is that Tomo and Diamond do such a good job of beating up talent that is just not as good as them. I will say I'm not exactly sold that they are like the number one or two bot lane in the NACL. We've seen a lot of really good bot lanes in the NACL that have been able to push forward even when their team is struggling. I'm not necessarily sure that Tomo and Diamond are those players, but what I can say for these two is that when it comes to them being able to take down the lower competition in the league, there are very few bot lanes that are going to be able to do it as consistently as these two are able to do it with their synergy that they've had from playing together, what, three years in a row now from Cloud9 to FlyQuest and now to Dignitas and, uh, you know, just their ability to be able to take over. I think Tomo's a really solid ADC. I think Diamond is an incredibly talented support. I think they've consistently been able to prove that. I think everybody else on the team was also fine, but mostly it was this bot lane that was driving it forward. It was mostly this bot lane that was holding Evil Geniuses back. Smoothie is going to get dud of the series again here. He has been incredibly disappointing to kick off the season. I honestly think he's been one of the most disappointing players in the entirety of the NACL. I thought he was getting so much better as the season went on last year, and it just feels like all of that progress has kind of regressed back to the mean in 2023. He really has been genuinely one of the worst supports in the region, and that's unfortunate. I understand that he hadn't he hasn't had his AD carry to play with the entire year so far. King is still not in North America, but still, I mean, at the end of the day, you still got to be able to play relatively good with a player like Mobility, who's not really making mistakes, and it's up to Smoothie to kind of push that bot lane forward. He's just not been able to do that. Another dead of the series for him. Mobility wasn't particularly good in this series either, but I'm not really expecting him to be. Like I said earlier in their series, Mobility just has to not be a problem, and I certainly don't think he's been the biggest problem for this Evil Geniuses team. The other player that I think you could really call out for not being good in the series is going to be Ryoma, who really has not started off the season incredibly hot. I know he's only been in NA for like three days, and so I'm willing to give him a little bit of leeway. I think realistically, he was probably the dud of the series, probably the worst player, because he accomplished nothing out of the mid lane position, which just isn't acceptable, quite frankly, but I'm willing to give him a little bit of leeway just because he's only been in the country for like three days and was thrust right into action, and I feel like next week is going to be a better barometer for how he's actually going to perform once he finally gets a chance to get comfortable with this team, and so Smoothie, Ryoma, not playing well at all for Evil Geniuses. I'm starting to get concerned with this team. I still think they can be good when they get everything together. I still think they can be a top-ish team, but I'm not necessarily sure they're going to be a top three team like I was projecting for them for a while. Dignitas, on the other hand is definitely in that conversation. They are right there with Cloud9 and Cincinnati Fear and 100 Thieves and anybody else, Team Liquid, anybody else you want to throw into that top five. I feel like Dignitas is right there with any of them and I truly do believe that they can beat any of them if they go up against them. This team has really proven a lot of my doubts and a lot of my thoughts uh, to be incorrect. They really are the real deal. Then we jump into our third series of day three here, and it's just the same story that I have often said about both of these teams, both kind of proving exactly who we thought they were. TSM Challengers taking on Immortals Challengers, and it's a 1-1 split, but game one was very close, very narrowly won out by TSM. Thanks in part due to some Haunter in game number one on the Scion, looking really, really solid. He continues to easily be the best member of this TSM Challengers team, and it's not particularly close. But game number two, entirely Immortals controlled, and uh, honestly, it's just a really good performance overall. My player of the series is going to go to Balulu in the mid lane, although I do think there is competition for this award on the side of Immortals, because as good as Balulu was, I do want to give a little bit of a shout out early on here to ADD, who I've been incredibly critical on. I think everybody has been incredibly critical on. He has gotten a ton of flame on Twitter, on Reddit, and 
you know, a lot of these analyst reviews, basically anybody who's talked about the games has talked about how bad ADD has been. And while I agree, he's definitely been very disappointing to start this year. He was actually really solid in this series, even when Hanser was playing well. In my opinion, easily the second or third best player across these two teams in this series, which was incredibly fun and impactful to see. Um, it's good to see that he still has it in him, but Balulu is going to get my player of the series. Another really good couple of games from him, especially game number two, where he really just was able to dominate Doxa in that matchup. They spent a ton of resources, Immortals that is, to go mid lane and make sure that Balulu was ahead and, and, you know, make sure that Doxa was behind in particular because they know that when Dox is ahead for TSM challengers, it's a lot easier for them to win games. When Dox is behind, it's a lot more difficult. And so they ended up going and just kind of camping mid lane and Balulu got a huge advantage off of that, was able to kind of snowball the game out of control and basically just win from there. Balulu's been fine in, in North America so far. I think he's been a positive for Immortals Challengers, probably the best player on that team. Actually, I would say, thinking about it now, definitely the best player on that team. Not necessarily one of like the standout players in the NACL, in my opinion, but definitely someone who I think you'd be very comfortable and confident having on a good team in the NACL. Uh, the rest of the team necess hasn't necessarily stepped up. I thought, like I said, ADD was pretty solid here, but the bot lane kind of let you down. Uh, Wixie didn't have a particularly good series. Not that Wild Turtle did either, but I think the bot lane was a little bit picked on on the side of Immortals, but overall your solo laners were enough to be able to carry you to the win. On the side of TSM, it's just the same story. It's literally the same exact story that we've been talking about all week. They got to play three series, one in each day, and it was the same story in all of them, where it's Hanser looks pretty good, Doxa looks good in one game and awful in the other, and Sven Skarin is just not up to this level. It's another dud of the series for Sven Skarin. He was really bad this week, honestly. He just, he had some decent early games, but his transition into the mid game is maybe the worst in the entire league. It's honestly very disappointing, and I think we're hitting the point where I'm going to start saying, like, maybe you should be looking for a replacement, because Svenskeren doesn't particularly give you a lot of upside. You know, you kind of know what you're going to get with him, and he's playing at such a low level right now that I'm not particularly sure that keeping him around really does you any favors. It doesn't seem like him and Doxa have any sort of mid-jungle chemistry that you would remove by getting rid of him. You know, I, I obviously think you brought Svenskeren on in case that something poor happened in the jungle and you needed someone to replace him at the LCS level, but Boogie has been fine. And I think you can afford to go for a more developmental prospect here in this position in TSM challengers. I just don't really see the benefit of having Sven Skarin on the roster if he's going to play like this, which is to say quite poorly and get out jungled by Chad, who has also been up and down, I would say over the course of this split, in my opinion, but Wild Turtle and Dragku, fine, whatever. Dragku actually had some moments where I thought he looked okay, but Wild Turtle, not so much. Uh, Dragku did kind of take advantage of Wixie in this series a bit, but um, the other AD carry, you know, a Wild Turtle in this series just couldn't make the most of it. I would say overall, TSM just looks meh. Like, they look like a meh team. They're going to be able to keep pace with a team like Immortals, but they're certainly not going to be able to outpace them in a lot of these series, and I honestly don't even think they looked all that good here. If mid-jungle continues to be as inconsistent as they are, I have a hard time believing they're going to win a lot of games. And then for Immortals, it's good to be able to pick up a 1-1 here, I think, against the TSM team. You've done a lot of those this year. 0-5 and 2 is not the worst record in the world. I think getting a good sign out of ADD, certainly not the worst thing in the world. Balulu looking solid, Chad looking better. If you can get a decent performance out of your bot lane, that really has disappointed so far this year. I think this team could be interesting just right now. I'm not exactly sure that they are anything above what we thought they were. These two teams are basically in the same exact bracket of teams right now, kind of right on that outside of the top 10 or right near top 10. I don't think either of them really showed anything in this series that made me change my mind on that at all. Moving on to our fourth series here, we have our second inter-squad friendly here of the week. We had FlyQuest Challengers taking on FlyFam and... You know, Team Liquid should be watching because this is how you beat up on your own provisional amateur team. I mean, uh, FlyQuest Challengers obviously looking pretty solid here. FlyFam definitely not as good as TL Faith or TL First. I keep messing that up. I'm sorry if I've messed that up in a lot of these videos, but um, TL First is obviously a little bit better, I would say, than FlyFam, but... Uh, FlyQuest Challengers definitely dispatching them in pretty confident and pretty dominating fashion. They were the better team here, again, off the back of their two main carry roles here in Spirax and Masu in the mid and AD carry positions. I know a lot of people are really high on Masu. I want to talk about him first, even though Spirax is my player of the series here. I want to talk about Masu. He's been really fun to watch. Like I said before, um, definitely want to see him be a little bit more consistent against some of the top teams in the league, but... You know, he's playing on 100 plus ping. He's not in uh, California with the rest of the team right now, which makes it even more impressive that he really has been playing as well and as dominant as he has been. And so 
Really impressed with him. If he can continue to grow, I mean, he could potentially be an LCS caliber 80 carry by the end of, like, spring split even, but probably by the end of the year, I think we could definitely be looking at that. And Spirax has always been on that trajectory. I talked about this a lot last year. He's going to get my player of the series again here against FlyFam. He's just been really, really solid for FlyQuest Challengers, in my opinion. As good as Masu has been, I think you could say that Masu has been their best player, but for me, it's Spirax that has been their best player, who has been their most consistent player. He's been the best in their wins and their losses, and I think that definitely shows another really solid series for him. He was actually able to really punish Blaze, who has been FlyFam's best player, I would say, over the course of the year so far, and that really, really impressed me. Spirax continues to grow. He very well could be like a top four or five mid in the NACL right now. Incredibly solid player with very good mechanics, a very good understanding of where he needs to be, when he can play aggressive, when he can't play aggressive, just kind of everything I wanted to look for in an NACL prospect. He could potentially be someone I could see at the LCS level very soon as well. As stacked, though, as mid lane is in the NACL, uh, Spirax is right up there with all of them. And then, like I said, Masu also playing well. Kitong was fantastic in the series. I really want to point that out. By the way, if I'm saying that wrong, I'm really sorry. I will admit I do watch a lot of these games a little bit sped up. And so, um, pardon if I'm not exactly saying their names right. I don't, you know, I don't get to listen to commentary. So, um, if I'm saying the, the players' names wrong, let me know down in the comment section below. But Kitong was really, really good in this game. I actually thought he was propelling Masu forward very, very efficiently on uh, FlyQuest Challengers going into Sword, going into Instinct. And so... Honestly, the bottom side of the map looking really solid. FlyQuest Challenger's top side is also good. UG and Philip have been a little bit disappointing, I would say, to start the season. That's kind of the reason they're not a top team, but still a, a really, really solid team and a, a really good win for them to pick up. And then for FlyFam, eh, like, I'm not particularly surprised that you lost to your own Challenger's team. Uh, nobody particularly looked good. Blaze is going to get my dud of the series here. Um, when he plays well, they have a chance of winning. When he doesn't, they definitely lose. And that's kind of been what FlyFam has offered. Maniac had another really poor series here, and I almost gave him my dud of the series but I want to give him some leeway in the very similar way that I gave it to Ryoma. So this one is going to go to Blaze. But again, Instinct and Sword continue to underperform. Uh, Lunasia probably had his best series of the year, ironically enough. I thought he was fine into that top lane matchup into Philip, but everybody else on the team very much disappointed. So FlyFam continues to look like one of the worst teams in the league. FlyQuest Challengers, definitely an interesting team right in that, you know, cluster of teams like Evil Geniuses, CLG, you know, I put, you know, a team like Wildcard, potentially Golden Guardians uh, in, in that conversation where these are teams that I think can beat basically anybody in the league, but I just need to see slightly more consistency out of them in order to believe that they are, you know, one of the top teams in the region. I think uh, FlyQuest is right within that. I think Spirax, Masu, Kitong have been really good. When Winsome comes back, this could be a very scary team with how good he has been playing at the LCS level if Philip and Yuji can get on the right track. FlyQuest Challengers could definitely be a team that skyrockets up the standings in the second half of the year. Then we get to move on to our fifth series here and our final bracket of week three. We kick that off with Golden Guardians Challengers taking on Team Liquid first. And Golden Guardians does the job. They're able to get the win here over TL first, which they absolutely should do. And it's in a way that really gives me a lot of confidence about this team. I know we've been talking about how if the top side is stable, the team will win. But I truly mean that. If the top side is stable, this team will win. If Concept and Rosethorn can play fine on this team, then I think the rest of the team is definitely good enough to carry. And I think that was definitely shown off here. My player of the series is going to go to Prismal in the support position. I've talked a lot for Golden Guardians this year about Young, and I've talked a lot about Array. I think both of them have really stepped up and been big carry presences. I think Prismal has honestly been a little bit lost in the shuffle in that conversation. I had him as my number one support in the NACL going into the year. Uh, and I think that while he hasn't necessarily lived, lived up to that, I think there have been some really good supports in the region to start the year. I think he's definitely close, and I don't think he's really, like, fallen off. He's made Array look really good, and honestly... Carry Prismal in game number two here on the Heimerdinger looked pretty solid. He was able to do a ton of damage, but that Nami game in game number one was also a lot of fun to watch. I still think Prismal is an LCS caliber support right now. I think that there were a lot of those in the NACL, to be quite frank. I think that, you know, support as a position in North America right now is just a position with a lot of really good talent on it. And uh, I'm not particularly surprised to see a lot of it performing in the NACL. Prismal, definitely an example of that. So he's going to get player of the series, but you could realistically give this to Array as well. Another really good series from him. He's had a really good year and a really good last two weeks. I actually thought he was kind of weak in week number one, you know, comparatively to a lot of the other AD carries. And I certainly wasn't super high on him going into the year compared to a lot of the other ADCs that were being hyped up. But I think he has very much climbed his way up those ADC rankings. He's certainly in the top like four or five ADCs in the NACL, maybe higher than than that right now, right? Where he's just playing incredibly solid, incredibly efficient League of Legends. He's doing a great job being able to win early game and translate that into some mid-game leads. Same thing for Young, who has been 
probably one of the best mid laners in the entire NACL. I know I say that for a lot of teams. There have been a lot of really good mid laners, and most NACL teams, I think, mid lane is their best position. That is not anything different for Golden Guardians, where Young has also been an LCS caliber mid laner. I know he wasn't particularly great in his time in the LCS, but I even think in that game against C9, he was fine, and, you know, obviously more time to practice with the team, he probably would have fared better. So that bot side of the map continues to look fantastic for Golden Guardians, and, you know, that's just going to continue. As long as Concept and Rosethorn can be fine on the upper side, I do think that this team can genuinely be a scary threat, way more so than I ever considered through the first couple of weeks of the season. But moving on to Team Liquid, Team Liquid first here. Eh, like, I'm, it's just tough. It's tough to kind of grade this team because they have players who can play. Like, they have talent on this team. They just can't really get it all to work at the same time. Um, Aspect has been very bad over the course of the first few weeks, but I thought he was actually much better in this series, and now it's Mia's time to let the team down. I don't think Mia was particularly great here. Rovex continues to really struggle in the support position. I very much almost gave Dud of the series to Rovex, but for me, it is going to go to City Witty in the jungle. Another poor performance from City Witty, who I think has has been poor this year. I, I've talked about this. I really do think that TL first is kind of hanging on the fact that Surdy has been incredibly solid up on the top side and that Mia occasionally has very good games on the bot side. But I think outside of that, TL first really doesn't have all that much talent to separate themselves from teams like, you know, Fly Fam or CLG Faith. I think they do a really good job of being able to pull out games as a team and with team effort. But I really don't see a lot of avenues for this team to break through and really become one of the more interesting teams in the NACL. I think this loss was pretty indicative of who they are. They're just a lower tier team. They're maybe like a half step above Fly Fam and CLG Faith, but to me, they're still a step down from teams like AoE Gold, who have shown just a tad bit more and have a little bit more upside on how to win games, in my opinion. So yeah, not, not a really great showing from TL first, and they really haven't had a ton of those this year. But for GG Challengers, I feel like this team gets better week after week. They really find out the way that they want to play. Mid lane, bot lane, both looking incredibly good, and top lane and jungle getting significantly more consistent. This team is now sitting at 3-3-1, which is honestly a pretty good record and a lot better than I think a lot of people were expecting of them. I had them as the worst challengers team moving into 2023 in my preseason rankings. That has clearly been wrong. They definitely do not deserve that moniker, and I think they're proving that every single game. Finally, we have our last series of the week here, our sixth and final series of day three. We had Wildcard Gaming taking on CLG Faith, and Wildcard picks up a big win here. They have a really solid week. Now, I know we were kind of critical of them in the first couple of days comparatively to, I think, what a lot of other people are saying, and I'm kind of still on that train. It's kind of funny. I was really high on Wildcard in the preseason. I had them as my best uh, provisional amateur team going into the year, which I don't think a lot of people did. I think a lot of people had the fear above them. Having Wildcard above everyone definitely made me feel pretty good when they looked solid, but I think with how they're winning, I think it's important to diagnose the why and not just the what that is happening. And I think with Wildcard, while they are inconsistent, like they just have so much talent and so many ability, uh, so many ways, I should say, to win games that it's pretty much impossible for them not to be at least competitive with some of the better teams. And going up against a team like CLG Faith, who actually did give them a little bit of trouble in this game, I actually think it was pretty pretty impressive how they were able to win it. So let's go ahead and talk about it. My player of the series is going to go to Keel on the side of Wildcard here. I know he was my dud of the series earlier, and that felt very harsh considering he actually had a pretty good Kindred game in game two of that series earlier uh, against CLG. I just didn't know how exactly to give a fair dud of the series in a series where it felt like Everybody played well, um, so Keel ended up getting it for that game one. He bounced back incredibly well here. Two very aggressive games. He dominated on Kha'Zix in game number one, a very fun game to watch, and then another really good Kindred game in game number two. It's just kind of how he rolls. He likes to play a little bit more aggro, and I do think that helps out Wildcard, obviously, with their top side being so aggressive and so willing to fight and trade all the time with Moose Hater. I think having a jungler that's willing to participate in that has been positive, and then having a very stable mid laner that can win games for you at this level is also good. We can talk about Moose Hater, a CLG Faith failed the vibe check and gave over Garen in game one. They did not make the mistake in game two, but it didn't really matter. He dominated game one, and so he wasn't. Yeah, you know, I, I don't understand. Why, why are we still allowing him to get this pick? At what point do we just say, I'm not gonna ego check them anymore? I'm just gonna ban the freaking Garen. He's such a different player on any champion that isn't Garen. It's why I have a hard time giving him player of the series in a lot of these series, because he will play fantastic in the Garen game and then he'll get it banned and it won't be good anymore, and I don't understand why we're not just banning the freaking Garen, like, I just don't, I don't get it, I'm starting to get tilted from it, um, let's talk about Saligo, he's incredibly good, and I think he keeps proving that, um, you know, we'll talk about Saranok in a bit, he gets done to the series here, I don't necessarily think he played bad, but 
his biggest contribution was playing Victor in game two and allowing Saligo to get super fed on the cast and kind of just end the game very quickly there. Uh, this top side of wildcard is just incredibly strong and will continue to win games against even some of the best competition at this level. Moose Hater, Keel, Saligo. Moose Hater and Saligo in particular have won basically every game that wildcard has won. This split, Lens and Duo King have been solid, but... That's all they need to be. They don't need to be these big carry threats. Even Duo King, who I think has been very, very, very good overall this year, uh, another support that has really impressed me, I don't think they've necessarily had to be the big dominant forces on that side of the map because it's always either Saligo or Moose Hater that are getting ahead in a lot of these games. And so that continues to be a winning formula for Wildcard, and I expect them to stick to it. As for CLG Faith, again, they are who we thought they were. They're just a team that got beat up by a better team than them. I don't think particularly anybody on CLG Faith played bad. I actually think the player that I have continuously gone to as kind of the well for, oh, you know, not not so good for CLG Faith in Bajani in the top lane, had his best series of the year by far, a fantastic Jax game in game number two. I actually feel really bad that he wasn't able to win this series because it's easily the best game that he's had at the NACL level. They took a uh, Moose Hater off of Garen, they put him on Udir, and he was very susceptible in that game number two, and I think Bajani did a really good job of taking advantage of that, unfortunately. Uh, Kassadin got out of control, and at that point, you're just not able to stop it. Keel did a good job uh, being able to supplement the rest of that damage with something like Kindred in the jungle and overall I just think Wildcard did a good job so Saranok is going to get my dead of the series again just kind of for letting that cast it in get a little bit out of control I didn't particularly like the Victor game in game two but I don't think anybody like atrociously stood out as being awful I actually think CLG Faith was for the most part generally fine just like generally not as good like it was a little bit of a team diff a little bit of a team effort that they ended up losing this I don't think anybody like dragged the rest of the team down I think they just weren't on the same level as a team like Wildcard which is not a particularly bad thing Wildcard is a good team and not being able to keep up with them isn't particularly surprising I think CLG Faith is still kind of meh but they at least kind of showed up a little bit in this performance especially Bajani who I thought had a really good game too and then for wild card you're just going to continue to roll along I still think the inconsistency is something that bothers me with this team I do want to see what happens if a team eventually just bans Garen two games in a row against Moose Hater is he going to be able, like is he going to struggle I do want to see it because it hasn't happened yet and I'm waiting for it to happen eventually it will happen I assume and when that happens I'm just interested to see how this team is going to perform but Keel and Saligo as a jungle mid are playing so well right now that I still have faith that this team is going to be incredibly solid, even if Topside isn't as dominantly aggressive as he has been in the first couple of games. All right, that is going to do it for my NACL Week 3 overview and analysis. Up on the screen right now, you're going to see the updated NACL standings. Of course, any ties will either be broken alphabetically or just by games played, depending on you know how it needs to be broken. Uh, in the first column to the right, you're going to see my updated power rankings. In the second column, you're going to see how those have changed. So let's go over the biggest risers and the biggest fallers. Um, my power rankings this week are going to be relatively controversial. I have some teams that I really like being ranked relatively low. It's just top 10 is incredibly difficult right now. I think the top 10 are, have separated themselves so much from the bottom 10, in my opinion, that it's very difficult to rank them. I think top 10 can go in almost any order, specifically like 6 to 10 is in any order that basically you want. This is just the order I feel most comfortable with them. Biggest riser this week is going to go to the fear. They jump from number 8 to number 3 in my power rankings. They have proved it at this point. They are a top three team in the NACL. I'm really hoping that they can hold on to this because they have genuinely been fantastic over the beginning part of this season. And I, I do have faith that this team is going to be able to keep them up, which is why they jump up in my power rankings. The other big riser, Wildcard, the other provisional amateur team, jumping from number 11 after kind of a down week two that people are forgetting about, back to number seven. This is a, a spot that they were at before after week one, and they have returned here now after a really good week three. Beating C9 makes them look incredibly strong. I have them as low as number seven. Some people are going to have them as high as like four, potentially even like three. Uh, you know, I think some teams might put them at. I still am a little bit worried about the consistency. I already talked about that. The bot lane hasn't exactly stood out to me, and I, I really want to see what happens when Moose or doesn't get Garen, but still, this is a team that absolutely deserves to be in the top six. Um, it's just very crowded right now, as I always say. Um, other risers, Dignitas jumping from four to two, definitely worth noting there. Immortals leapfrogging TSM to go to number 11, and then CLG jumping FlyQuest to go to number 15. Biggest fallers this week, uh, biggest faller this week is going to be Evil Geniuses. That should be no shock. This team is starting to worry me. I'm not going to get entirely concerned, but I'm going to get a little bit concerned. Evil Geniuses is, is going to drop from number two to number six. They could fall even further as the weeks go on. I still have faith that once King comes in, this team is going to at least be competent. But you want to put Wildcard ahead of them? Great. You want to put CLG and FlyQuest ahead of them? Great. They have been better, in my opinion, so far this year, but... 
I have faith that Evil Geniuses should theoretically be better than those teams. They had a tough week in terms of schedules, uh, and they weren't really able to perform. But for now, they're on, you know, thin ice. They could keep falling if they continue to be a problem. TSM falling down to number 12. That's three spots. They just were not good this week. We'll talk about that in a second. CLG falling to eight. I feel bad. They were fine this week, but... Um, a lot of teams I wanted to move up. Same with FlyQuest moving down to number nine. Uh, just a couple of teams that I wanted to move up. Wildcard, Fear. You know, a lot of these teams needed to go higher in the standings. And unfortunately, that was at the expense of teams like CLG and FlyQuest, who I think would have been fine, just not necessarily as impressive as some of the teams above them. And then 100 Thieves dropping down to number four from number three. But that's going to do it for my standings overview. It's time to get to my player of the week and my dud of the week for week three here. My player of the week. I definitely had a couple of good options here, but I ended up settling on... Trevor, the support for the Cincinnati Fear. I'm incredibly high on Trevor as a player, and I think he absolutely deserves Player of the Week here in Week 3. The Fear are unstoppable right now, looking incredibly fun, incredibly good, and I'm really, really happy to see that. Trevor is looking like the best support in the region, and I hope he's able to keep that up. Obviously, other player that I considered here, honorable mention, going to APA on Team Liquid Challengers, who just continues to look incredibly solid there. My Dud of the Week. Definitely had competition here, but I'm going to give it to Sven Skarin on TSM Challengers. He just has not been able to perform at this level. He really is not good right now, even against some of the more mad junglers in the league. He just has not been able to play at the NACL level and is starting to get concerning. Obviously, the other players I consider, Doxa, the mid laner for TSM Challengers, was definitely in consideration. And then also, of course, Smoothie, the support for Evil Geniuses Challengers, who has just not been good. Those are the three players that I kind of considered, but I landed on Sven Skarin for Dud of the Week and Trevor for Player of the Week. But... That's going to do it. Let me know what you guys thought of this video down in the comments section below. Who am I rating too high? Who am I rating too low? What are you guys' thoughts and opinions? Of course, let me know down there. Of course, also hit that like button if you made it this far. I really do appreciate you guys watching and liking this content. If you're interested in more NACL content, hit that like button. It really does let me know you guys are enjoying what I'm putting out here. And of course, if you are new, hit that subscribe button. Not only do I do NACL, I do LCS, LEC, LPL, LCK, all four major regions every single week. So if you're interested in that kind of content, hit subscribe if you are new. But of course, with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day, and I will see you all later.